name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. During the Christmas and Epiphany seasons, our thoughts are directed towards the wonder and the person of the Incarnation, the incredible event in which God himself, for love of man, condescends to become one of us, to take on our humanity and become truly man. Not only are we to marvel at this movement of God, who does not simply take on human nature in order to live as one of us and be with us, but also to die for us in order to pay the debt for sins which we cannot pay. He goes beyond those people of the chosen race and reveals himself to all mankind. In the Feast of the Epiphany, the gifts of the three kings remind us who the child really is and why he comes. As we saw recently, the gold signifies his kingship, the frankincense his divinity, and myrrh his destiny to die for us. In the Sunday after the Epiphany, we were shown our Lord's finding in the temple and saw how even the divinity itself in the second person of the Blessed Trinity humbles himself after astonishing the teachers and the doctors by his knowledge, but then does something far more astonishing, and that is to become subject to a human father, a carpenter, and his human mother, the Blessed Virgin. Of one element of this subjection, I will speak in a moment. Now, we've talked before about the different senses of the scriptures, the literal sense, the sense in which the scriptures teach us of morality, the sense which shows us something of our future life in heaven. Today's gospel, of course, is no exception, rich in symbolism and meaning, worthy of much study and meditation. Our savior chooses to be present at this occasion for several reasons, to pay his respects to his earthly kinsfolk, and honor their marriage by his presence, that by a miracle he may make himself known to his disciples and show his power, that he is in fact the long-awaited Messiah, that he might sanction and sanctify marriage. For us, most certainly, but also to condemn the followers of Tatian and the Ancretites who would go soon to condemn marriage and even wine itself as being evil. Now, regarding the sanctification and sanction of marriage, St. Bede says beautifully, if there were any fault to be found in wedlock, duly and chastely celebrated, the Lord would not have been present at marriage. Good, he says, is holy wedlock. Better is continence of widowhood. Best of all is perfect virginity. Thus, Christ was born of a virgin. He was blessed by the prophetic lips of the widow Anna. He came invited as a guest to a wedding. Thus do we see the Lord Jesus commends all three states. Now, what our Lord's apparent subjection to his earthly parents, what of it? While we are often told that Our Lady kept all of these things in her heart, today we see the Blessed Virgin in a far more active role, that as intercessor. By this passage, we are moved to reflect on the Blessed Virgin's power, her kindness, her mercy. And we can use it, as so many others in Scripture, to reflect, to take consolation in, and grow in knowledge and love of the Blessed Virgin. Now, concerning the request of the Mother of God that our Lord perform a miracle to help the wedding party, we need not dwell at all on the idea that she did this, at, that some form of glory might be attributed to her, and that this is why his answer, that of woman, seems harsh. The explanation given to us by the saints is that he means to distinguish between his role as man and his role as God, and that as God, he is not subject to the prescriptions of men, but acts purely from divine wisdom and power. And yet, lest anyone think that he does rebuke her harshly, we may simply acknowledge that in fact, he does bow to her request. He does in fact come to the aid of the wedding party. St. John Chrysostom also adds that in fact, he is moved to accede to her request to show those around the honor that he has for her. So much for our Lord's apparent rebuke of his own mother. Although a rather simple exchange between the mother and the son, the passage has profound implications for the church's understanding of the intercessory power of Our Lady and should provide us with an increased confidence and zeal in approaching her and entrusting her. And yet, why is her intercession so powerful? St. Antoninus says that while the prayers of the saints have the quality of a request, 
those of Our Lady, because of the unique relationship she has with Our Lord, her prayers take on the notion of a command. Not that a creature can command God, but that he loves and honors her so much that he is, in a certain sense, willing to look upon her request as such. And because of this, he will refuse nothing that she asks. St. Bridget adds that our Lord said to the Blessed Virgin, because you refused me nothing on earth, I will refuse you nothing in heaven. St. Alphonse Liguori, who, as we know, has written volumes about the Blessed Virgin, says that this unique mediatorship is in a way due to the fact that our Lord is under an obligation to her that he hears all the requests of the Blessed Virgin due to the obligation he is under for having her given him his humanity. While these sublime truths can and should move us to greater confidence in her, we must remind ourselves that we cannot presume her intercession and the granting of requests if we do not ask her. Granted, we often say that Our Lady is interceding for us due to her compassion for us even before we ask, but there would seem to be something of presumption if we relied on her intercession without turning to her when we needed to. St. Alphonsus even laments those who have been given the knowledge of her powerful role and who have even received of her intercession and who then fail to ask and pray to her again when they need to. This should be a reminder to all of us who have perhaps waned somewhat in our practices and prayers to her. And so we should try to move ourselves again to a greater zeal and return to those devotions and prayers that we perhaps once had and not let the seeming lack of an answer hold us back. Remembering what the Catechism of Trent says, that our prayers are always answered, just not always in the way we would like. St. Gertrude tells us that of all, all the graces we ask of God through Mary will be granted to us. Let's repeat that. All of the graces that we ask of God through Mary will be given us. What an astonishing thing to think, and how much cause for renewed hope and confidence in her. Now, the Church has traditionally called Our Lady the mediatrix of all graces, an idea that is supposedly controversial in these days for some reason. So Thomas Aquinas says that to unite men to God pertains to our Lord. He alone is perfect mediator, and yet there is nothing to prevent others from being called mediators between God and man insofar as they cooperate in uniting men to God. If this mediatorship is possible with the saints, how much more then by the prayers of the one who is the mother of the Savior? The church tells us that she is a mediator in two ways, by her cooperation in the incarnation and by her intercession in heaven. Our Lady fully cooperated in the, in, in the incarnation of Christ by giving her free consent to becoming the mother of the Messiah. The Church Fathers contrast the consent of the Blessed Virgin with the disobedience of Eve. Eve, by her disobedience, brought death and suffering into the world. And yet Our Lady, by her obedience and her sheer desire and longing to serve God, brought the author of life into the world so that he could destroy death and suffering. Our Lady, by obedience, became a cause of the salvation of the whole human race. She is also mediatrix of all graces by her intercession in heaven. Since her assumption into heaven, Our Lady sees ever more clearly our wants and distresses, and she participates in the distribution of grace by her maternal intercession, which, while it of course is inferior to that of the intercessory prayer of our Lord, is also far superior to any of the saints of heaven. According to the consensus of the older and many newer theologians, Our Lady's cooperation extends to all the graces given to men. Not that we must pray to her for everything that is received, but that according to the providence of God, nobody receives of the redemptive power of Christ without the intercession and cooperation of the Blessed Virgin. Again, nobody receives of the redemptive power of our Lord without her intercession and cooperation. So, a few points about her role here. Since the theologians tell us Our Lady gave the source of all grace to men by her cooperation, it is to be expected that she would cooperate in the distribution of those same graces. Secondly, as she is also spiritual mother of those who are redeemed, it is fitting that by her intercession she should care for their spiritual wants also. Third, Our Lady is a prototype or a prefigure of the Church, as all grace and redemption 
comes through the church, then the Blessed Virgin, by her intercession, is the universal mediator of all graces. Given what we've said regarding the, ro the role and power that she has, and asking ourselves if, perhaps, some of our practices and devotions have slipped or even disappeared, St. Alphonsus Liguori reminds us of the practices that we traditionally give to her. Of course, reciting five decades of the rosary every day, not only with family, but also alone if necessary. To fast or do some kind of penance on Saturday in her honor, this was a traditional practice. Saying the Angelus morning, noon, and evening, frequent Hail Marys during the day. To recite the Litany of the Blessed Virgin regularly, perhaps before her image. And considering the abundant graces available to us to wear the brown scapula and similarly to practice the first Saturday devotion. There are many devotions which honor and petition the Mother of God. But, Alphonsus tells us, one of the most useful and important is to recommend ourselves and our intentions frequently to her by three Hail Marys, invoking her name, especially during times of temptation. Finally, I focused on the intercessory power of the Virgin, demonstrated so clearly at Cana, and while the passage is saturated in symbolism and meaning on many different fronts, one of the other main themes we mentioned, of course, is that of marriage. It is no coincidence that Christ chooses a wedding in which to show forth his first public miracle. By doing so, he imparts his blessing to it, he sanctifies it, he sanctions it. He who is its very author. I will finish on this point that we have looked in recent years on the different senses of scripture and also how the scriptures and even the writings of the saints and the popes will often seem to speak very clearly for our own time to us. And so we might well ask, in what way does this simple act, the appearance of the savior at a wedding 2000 years ago, relate to us here and now? We saw briefly how Christ was sanctioning marriage partly, partly, to condemn the followers of Tatian and the Encratites and other sects that saw marriage as evil, as being from the devil. And yet, what do we see now all around us if not a global repeat of this same view of marriage, that of being evil, an enslavement of women, a tool of misogyny, and all around us, entire sections of society, subcultures, politicians, education, the media, lamentably, even some inside the church, attack this institution, once seen and still in reality, the building block and foundation of society. What possible remedy is there of this global, demonic, orchestrated, organized, and financed attack on this most holy institution that St. John the Baptist even had to lose his head over? What can I possibly do? What can Father Stewart do? What can you do, dear faithful? Well, certainly I, we, can make sure to defend and promote the absolute necessity of the traditional family in society. Make sure we do not practice, promote, or advocate any of the things that attack it. Speak out when it is undermined, when those around us promote such things. But against the orchestrated, organized, planned international movement against the family, we can do nothing. But we know someone who can. It was Our Lady who moved our Lord to change water into wine at that hallowed wedding, to instigate his first miracle. And it is Our Lady who will, by her powerful intercession and by her role as mediatrix of all graces, change the hearts of friends, of relatives, of our enemies, to realize the evil being perpetrated against the family. And if they will not realize their errors, ultimately, her and her son will destroy those errors anyway. Likewise, it is Our Lady that will take care of us in our needs, protect us and our families against the dreadful sin and moral collapse that we now see, if we are devoted to her maternal protection. And it is Our Lady who can and will hear and answer our prayers, even our most desperate and hopeless, as long as we persevere and do not lose confidence in her, and as long as we continue to listen to her when she tells us to do whatever he tells you. May God bless you all in our continued journey to the wedding banquet with the Savior and with his mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.